I'm Dan Snow. Welcome to Voices of the First World War. In the years leading up to the centenary of the war, the last of those who actually experienced it have passed away. But the Imperial War Museums and the BBC had recorded interviews with many veterans to try to capture what it was like to actually be there. This series listens to those stories. In August 1914, France was bathed in a glorious summer. The streets were lined by the French crowd, and they were wild with excitement. Vive l'Angleterre, vive les Anglais. They were absolutely wild. We marched past that and marched to a field, a large field, which had been prepared because there were tents, and it was where we were going to encamp for the night. This field and the area was the actual site where Napoleon's army encamped in preparation for the intended invasion of England. But you could just discern in the distance the English coastline. The whole town had turned out, about 3,000 persons, I should think, to see this extraordinary sight, a Scottish regiment arriving in their midst. And there was the mayor in his robes and the little girl with a bunch of flowers, the colonel, and the dress in French, which I'm afraid my French was rather halting, I didn't altogether get, but the gist of it was uh, how delighted they were to welcome the British to their soil and how we'd fight together and be brothers in the war and so forth, and uh, so to bed. The small but professional British expeditionary force landed on the coast of northern France and prepared to head inland to try and halt the German invasion. The Royal Flying Corps, a precursor to the RAF, based themselves in Mauberge, inland near the Belgian border. Ewan Rabagliati was a pilot with five squadron. From Mauberge, where the flying corps had landed, we were told to go to the given area east. We were told we should see advancing German troops. And so we were very, very excited and we looked for them. And, of course, in those days you were very limited in your facilities. You had a map strapped on one knee and you had a piece of paper, a pad with a pencil on the other, and it was, it was, rather, it was rather wobbly about. And you, were, they, you couldn't do very much careful, but you had your map and you looked. Well... We, as soon as we got over our area, instead of seeing a few odd German troops, I saw the whole area covered with field grey advancing humans. Machines, transport, guns, infantry, cavalry, and we were completely, my pilot and I, we were completely astounded because it was, it was not a little more than we'd been looking for, it was infinitely more. In fact, it looked as though the place was alive with the Germans. Rabagliati was watching the right wing of the huge German advance, heading straight for the Belgian town of Mons. The British had just arrived in Mons, and it was in this industrial town, here on the banks of the canal that ran through it, that the first battle would take place between the British and Germans on the 23rd of August. Robert Money, Thomas Painting... Walter Birchmore, A. E. Gar, William Collins and Frederick Atkinson were there. Years later, they told their stories. And on the morning of the 21st, we started to march up to, up to Mons, scorching hot. And the marching was terrible. The route national was straight as a die. You could see for miles in front of you, oh, the road seemed endless. You better try and marching. And we came uh, roaring back and we landed. Whereupon I was put into a motor car by my squadron commander and taken off to GHQ, which was in the chateau some miles away. And as we arrived, we were ushered in, and there was, uh, we went into a room with a lot of, of, of elderly gentlemen covered in gold, gold lace and all the rest of it, all these senior generals. It was Sir John French's own personal uh, conference going on. And uh, we had uh, no information about the enemy at all, so far as we knew, it's a peace march. And come the morning, we set off and we found two other battalions that arrived, the Welsh Fusiliers, the Middlesex, and we were now the 19th Brigade, the completely ad hoc headquarters. And when we got to the area that we were going to build, we were told, oh, no, you're not going to build it there. You're going to go up to the canal and you'll take up an outpost position on the canal. I belong to D Company of the 4th Middlesex Regiment. We took up position on a station called Oberg, six kilometres ahead of Mons. We took up position there about four in the afternoon and my platoon, 13, happened to be on the roof. We fraternised with the people during the evenings and were anxiously awaiting the arrival of the Germans. 
but little did we know what was coming. We had reached a village about three miles from Mons in our advance towards the German armies and we were enjoying the hospitality of the villagers when quite out of the blue came the order, prepare for action, get mounted. And somebody announced us and he said, oh, here's a boy from the flying corps, come here and sit down. So I was put to sit next to him rather, rather terrifiedly and I showed him a map all marked out. He said, have you been over that area? And I said, yes, sir. And uh, I explained what I'd seen and they were enormously interested and then they began reading the figures that I'd estimated, whereupon I seemed to feel that their interest faded. They seemed to look at each other and shrug their shoulders. And uh, then French turned round to me and said, now, yes, my boy, this is terribly interesting, but what, tell me all about an airplane. Are they very cold? Can you see anything? Uh, what do you do if your engine stops and all that sort of stuff? And I couldn't bring him back to Earth because obviously uh, he wasn't interested. He looked at me and he said, yes, this is very interesting what you've got, but you know our information, which of course is correct, proves that I don't think you could really have seen as much as you think. Well, of course, I quite understand you may imagine you have, but it, it's, it's not the case. We had rode out of the village about a couple of miles. We came into action on the high ground overlooking Mons. And uh, eventually we became uh, on the scene of the conflict. And uh, from the distance you could see the shells bursting and the guns firing and so on. We immediately engaged the German artillery and that developed into a regular artillery duel. They came upon us like rows of houses. And I can quite believe with some of the things I read in a book about us meeting the most formidable war machine that man has ever produced. We suddenly saw these people coming, didn't realise who they were at first, and we said, by crikey, it's bloody Germans. They seem to be forming an enveloping movement over the Monscondi Canal. I heard the first shell burst above my head. It was a shrapnel shell, and the bullets came down like whistling like all the hobs of hell with a as if a thousand whistles had been turned on, you know. And the bullets, of course, were round, but they had a little tick on them that made them whistle as they came through the air. That was my first shell. We started gunfire immediately. We fired an open sights, fused north. They got about 200 yards from the guns and galloped away to the left and rode right into a squadron of our own cavalry who dealt with them then. They came down like... We were soon depleted in numbers, artillery brought up to bear on the station and we were told to retire one at a time as we had to get down a ladder. By that time the platoon was reduced to a few men. Our company officer and second in command was out of action and the company was taken over by NCOs to which I must give the greatest praise. We retired fighting small rear guard actions and that in all probability was the commencement of the long retreat from Mons and the many rear guard actions were fought over that 12 days. As you can tell from these stories, the British generals had no idea of the scale and imminence of the German threat. As a result, after a brief but fierce morning's resistance, the British were pushed back from their positions. The British retreated. None of the soldiers guessed it at the time, but this was the beginning of one of the longest and most gruelling retreats in British history. Major Philip Joubert flew in three squadron, Royal Flying Corps. I had an in- interesting and rather difficult reconnaissance to do, in course of which I got rather badly shot up, but fortunately without any fatal results and managed to get back with a report which, amongst others, indicated in the very serious nature in which the British Expeditionary Force found itself. We were really outnumbered and outflanked, and uh, we had to get out quite quickly. I know the troops were very upset at having to withdraw because they thought they'd beaten the Germans in front of them. What they didn't know was that coming round the corner was an outflanking party that was going to make a lot of trouble for them if they didn't get out. We hadn't been in action very long before uh, the order came to move, which uh, we did. We moved back again. And then our journey back, we went through a grove of trees which was being heavily shelled. And after continuing taking up positions like this, uh, one after another, night fell. About midnight, we heard a certain amount of shooting on our right, and uh, people were alerted. And at two o'clock, the commanding officer got orders that we were to get out at once and withdraw. And that furthermore, there was a bend in the canal about a mile and a half away, and that he must be round that with the whole of the battalion before daylight. 
Uh, well, of course, it was a tedious business getting the people roused uh, and uh, to get them all moving down the towpath again. And it was about five minutes to four when we got round the bend, and I saw the Colonel heave quite a sigh of relief. We had to pull back a little bit. Jerry played a searchlight on us during the night, and uh, we thought we were going to be for it, but early the next morning, the retirement started. Trooper A. Gar, Private Robert Money, and Sergeant Thomas Painting recalling the beginning of the 200-mile retreat into France. Mons was instantly mythologised. A propaganda story emerged of a guardian angel of Mons that was seen protecting British troops. But for some at home in Britain, the reality was plain to see. Elspeth George was a schoolgirl in Britain during the summer of 1914 and was interviewed in 1963 by the BBC. And then the troop train started coming back from Mons, Train load after train load of them with frightfully severely wounded people. And, of course, all the women and children in the village gathered up all the comforts we could find, fruit and soup and everything we could think of. She was prevented from helping any of the German prisoners of war. There was one that I saw lying without even a wisp of straw to lie on, and there was one terribly young one who upset us terribly. We weren't even allowed to give him a drink of water because... We were pushed back even by the local village people, let alone the guard himself with his bayonet. He was lying so severely wounded and crying for his mother. We weren't even allowed to go near them. The next few years would see a total transformation in tactics and technology. But at its start, in August 1914, there were still echoes of an older kind of warfare. Sitting on my top of my Maltese cart, I could see in the distance one of the sights that one could seldom see. I saw Germans and British cavalry fighting with swords, cut and thrust, and I thought, well, what an extraordinary thing. But there they were, cutting and thrusting, about three quarters of a mile away. For many, Mons was the first taste of the realities of war. Charles Carrington recalled in 1964 how war took men to the very extremes of physical and mental endurance. When you were listening to this sound of the shells coming over, uh, every now and again you would, uh, there would be one which you made sure was coming very close indeed. The noise would get louder and louder and the machine seemed to accelerate until it was making a great roar like an aeroplane coming in to land on the tarmac. And uh, there would come a point at which uh, your resolution would break. You'd say, this is one for me. And in this flash of time, in a a fifth of a second, you decide that this is the one and you throw yourself down into the mud and cringe into the bottom of the shell hole. But sometimes you miscalculate, and this is a shell that isn't for you at all, but it goes sailing busily on and plunks down on somebody else three or four hundred yards away. Then you get up and roar with laughter. And the other ones who laugh at you for having been the first one to throw yourself down, and this, of course, is, is hysterics. It becomes a kind of game, and the first person in a group um, who shows the sign of fear by giving way and taking cover, um, he's lost a point, and it counts against him, and the one who holds out longest has gained a point. But in what game? What is this for? Now, this is the problem that I am still unable to solve, that after this long time, and after I'd been... 18 months uh, in France and had been through several big battles um, that I was still trying to pretend to be brave and not succeeding very well and so were we all. 